Thank you very much. And I'm happy to have such a <clears throat> all-inclusive title. Um, I actually changed it to Connecting Dots, uh, which is also quite all-inclusive. But um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, uh, as Tony said, a PhD candidate at the Unit of Energy Systems Analysis. And, uh, well, I'm going to start with with this very broad picture that the world is interlinked and interconnected. And I'm certainly not the first one to acknowledge that. Uh, for instance, a bunch of heads of states um, agreed on this when they signed the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the UN Agenda 2030 two years ago. That in, includes goals on ending hu hunger, on uh, education for all, on climate action, on life below water, and so on. And in the goal text itself, it um, acknowledges that all of these goals are connected, and solving one requires that we solve them all. So let's agree on that, that everything is connected, which makes the world and our lives quite complex, doesn't it? And it's one, one thing to acknowledge this complexity, but another to try to handle it and try to move things forward in this complexity. Um, and there are several ways to do this. Uh, I come from systems analysis background or <clears throat> a systems background and I try to look at the world as systems. And rather than to look into the detail of all of those systems, I look at how they are connected. So that's hence connecting the dots. And uh, the worlds that they, these different systems grew up in or developed in are, are not always talking to each other. They are traditionally handled separately. So how can we get those worlds to meet? Well, the first arena for this, ah, um, for, for looking at these connections, I get from my PhD research, where I look at how strategies to handle climate change, land use, energy and water are inter interrelated and impact one another. So I made some, uh, I've copied some pictures on this in case they need clarification. Um, but what I do want to emphasize again is not what happens here or what happens here, but what happens in between. So anytime we flush our toilets or take a shower, we use energy. We actually use water, but that water needs energy to get to our bathroom. And if we want a comfortable shower, we might, we might want to heat that water a little bit. And then we've, when we've done with whatever we need the water for, we need energy again to treat that water to a quality that we can release into the environment. But any time we turn on a light bulb or get on a plane to Dublin or anywhere else, the fuel that is burned or the electricity that is used to, to get us to do that requires uh, water, either in oil extraction or in growing biofuels or in cooling the thermal cycles of our power plants. Yeah, so I added some extra arrows there because there's a lot of water going into our energy system. And for each of those power plants and each of those oil fields and the cropland for biofuels, we need land. And that land could otherwise have been used for something else, for uh, farming for food or building a new neighborhood or what have you. And that land, the neighborhood or the city or the farmland, that actually needs energy too. In the machinery that we put on our, our farms and the fertilizers that we put on, uh, on the farmland, uh, as well as the transportation fuels that is needed to get our ever-growing cities and the communication and mobility of them to function. So I'm just adding some extra arrows here and there to just emphasize these interlinkages. And of course, if there is anything living on the land, that will need water to survive. If it's a forest or a jungle or a farmland or your garden, we need rain to fall from the sky or to artificially add it through an irrigation system or a gardening house hose. And of course, if we give water land and we stay away from that land, that water will be purified, especially wetlands are very good at purifying water, which is a great service for all of us humans. And if we give it other types of land, we can, we can control the flow. So if we take a valley and take all of the land that's in that valley and fill it with water, with water, we have a reservoir. And then we can control when we use the water or even produce electricity. Uh, and lastly, we have climate change upon us. Um, on a global scale, it is high time to decarbonize our societies in order to meet international climate targets. 
and uh, to avoid the devastating climate change that scientists have for some years warned us about if we keep emitting fossil greenhouse gas emissions. So pick any national climate action plan or any climate action plan that I know of and you will find energy in there because energy is a key sector where a lot of the fossil fuels that we need to stop using are being used today. But land use is also contributing to climate change because different types of land cover has a different capacity to store carbon. So if we change land use, we can either increase the carbon sink of that land or we can release carbon as an effect. And uh, I forgot to put the arrows here, which I'm sure you've longed to see. <laughs> yes, if we flip the climate coin, we get other impacts and climate change is often said to be manifested through water, through droughts, through floods, through heavier storms and rainfall, etc. And uh, <clears throat> in addition to that, we have a, a different precipitation uh, and um, water cycle. We also have a different temperature in different places if climate change accelerates. And that means that we can maybe not grow food in the same places. So that impacts land use. And then that might impact energy if we, if we had grown biofuels there. Maybe we cannot grow biofuels there anymore because the climate change, the land and the conditions for that farming. So these are, this is not a pretty picture and it's not supposed to be a pretty picture. Uh, I do apologize for, for how unpretty it is. Uh, and I'm not intending for you to sort of see this as a very clear diagram. Um, even though each of these arrows are possible to explain quite easily, as I hope I managed to do today, keeping all of this at once in the back of your head when you're trying to make a decision over here is not super simple. So how do we decide on how best to change, for instance, the energy system? Acknowledging that everything is interlinked and acknowledging that those decisions probably impact the opportunities to do and to manage the other systems. Well, that's perhaps not the most important questions because those decisions are already being made. These are some headlines just from the first week of October this year, primarily. And it's plans and plans and plans being implemented and suggested and revised and so on. So the decisions are being made on a very impressive scale and speed. And I do want to emphasize that that's a very good thing because the challenges that we're facing demands us to move <laughs> quickly. Uh, so rather than to sit in my chamber and to look at, okay, how can we optimally look at all of this together and then find a way to deal with it? Let's see what we have and how a target that's put in there somewhere, if that's a robust target or if it makes us vulnerable. Um, the scale on which I look at this is the city scale. And uh, I'd like to present just some very simple results from a pilot study on New York City, which has, uh, and I looked at their sustainability plan, which is an ambitious one, and that I, uh, I'm not at all criticizing that. I think it's a great plan. It has loads of interventions in it, divided into water quality, public health, buildings, energy efficiency, and so on. And I looked at a, a very small set of interventions that are mentioned in the plan, but are mentioned in different chapters. Uh, and I focused on the water and energy chapters. But I looked at all of them from an energy efficiency point of view. So I'm just going to run through this quite quickly. Uh, a, a rain barrel. That comes from the water chapter. Surprise, surprise. Um, and the reason for putting a... Uh, putting in a rain barrel in a city like in a garden in a city like New York is to avoid uh, too much water to flow into the combined sewer system when when there are heavy rains so many rain barrels can kind of retain some of that water and avoid some rainwater going into the wastewater treatment plants and in the wastewater treatment plants if it would go there it would have used energy so we can actually measure the impact on a city scale from not using that energy. Uh, we can measure it uh, a little bit more if we look at low flow toilets, which is obviously also a water interventions, intervention. If every household in New York switched to a low flow toilets, 
they would save a lot of water, but they would indirectly also save a little bit of energy because the water system requires that energy. A more obvious energy efficiency measure is the switch to a efficient washing machine because we have all of those indirect water impacts, but then of course a washing machine also uses energy directly. Um, it's potentially as good or close to as good as a green roof, which is another water measure that if we put green on our buildings and um, uh, either as a garden or as a uh, sort of sheet of moss with the right features in it, we can retain some of the same rainwater or actually a lot more rainwater than we could do in a, in a rain barrel. And that's primarily because there are a lot, of more, a lot more roofs than there are gardens in New York, but also because um, green roofs have, have been proven to be quite efficient at storing rainwater. But the energy efficiency component here actually comes from the fact that a green roof cools the building if it's placed on top of it. And it can also insulate the building. So it reduces both the air conditioning needs and the space heating needs in different seasons. Now, this is not a surprise. An energy efficient light bulb is what it says it is. It's energy efficient. Um, so it should be up here in, on the high end of the chart, shouldn't it? So if every household in New York switched 50% of their light bulbs to energy efficient ones, the energy savings would be quite significant. However, not as significant as if they would change to a low flow shower head. Um, and this is a particular result for New York because many of the households in New York use quite inefficient water heating technologies. So this list does not necessarily uh, look the same if I would apply it to Stockholm. And I do want to emphasize that um, because the, what I'm trying to do here is not so much to give a list of how to reduce our energy use or how to reduce our carbon footprint or so on. Um, not at all, actually. I, what I'm finding in this research is that the best option completely depends on the context, on this complex interconnectedness that is not the same in different cities or for different people. And hopefully this type of work can bring some clarity or even some good blur to the picture that can give those that are in a position to push sustainable development in cities more insight on whether their options are a no-brainer or if it might need some adjustment to be sustainable from more than one resource perspective. And I do want to just mention here, if we would put water efficiency on this, actually the light bulbs would come out on top because the electricity that we could save from using more efficient light bulbs, that electricity is much more water intensive than the natural gas that we would save if we switched our shower heads. So it's a lot of these things are quite unintuitive. Um, and so the merit of this work is to hopefully empower people with information and knowledge to look at their systems and their own decisions that they're facing rather than to give them straight answers. And that hopefully seamlessly moves me into my other dot connecting experience that I'd like to share with you today. So a quick poll, how many in here has climate anxiety now and then? Hey, that's great. That's actually very healthy <laughs> considering the magnitude of the problem. But it also sucks, doesn't it? <clears throat> this combination of knowing that we have a problem, but not quite knowing what I should do about it. Um, well, I have it and I still have it, but I've also tried to do something about it in the last couple of years. And it's helping a little. So my something is that I started an NGO four years ago together with my husband to try to <clears throat> lift conversation about climate change out of the universities and out of the environmental movement as it's traditionally built. And to all of those that are, that who are said to hold the key to solve it all, which is everyone, which is all of us, which is the non-experts and the non-activists with large carbon footprints and high levels of climate anxiety. Those are the people that needs to be engaged and to act on climate change, it's, it's being said. So uh, we call this NGO Storm Warning. And with Storm Warning, the aim is to make climate conversation accessible 
without trying to simplify it too much. So I'm, I'm quite fond of this staying in a world of complexity, not trying to make it less complex, just making things more accessible. And we do that by first shedding light on the challenges we face from different angles, sometimes just diving into the morality or, uh, or the anxiety, where does it come from, what do we tell our kids, that type of discussion, or, but sometimes just looking at the high-tech solutions that are already there, that are ready to be picked up. Picked up. Or look at the economics or the diets or the marketing strategies that could help or hinder the transitions that we need. And second, we don't just talk. We also want people to actually listen and to show up, at least, to the events that we host. And for that reason, um, we only create nice events. And what do we mean by that? And how do we create a nice event with a good atmosphere? Well, our decision is to add arts and culture and music to it. And you can just look at any free open seminar with a climate expert and compare it to a free open concert with a popular artist to see why we've chosen this strategy. Uh, we really do want people to come into the room. Um, but it's, I do want to emphasize that it's much more than that. <clears throat> um, because we've noticed that the music that these very talented artists create and, and play for us during our sessions, as we call them, um, they manage to emphasize the messages that the scientists tell us in a way that skips the head and the logic and makes us actually feel it. And I believe um, that that makes us want to act much more if we, than if we just know it but don't feel it. Um, I believe that the climate change challenge needs us to get itching and needs us to start longing for the better and needs us to actually feel that I can do something, you can probably do something, and over there you can do something. And then to get that feeling and to, to start asking ourselves, okay, so what is it that I could do? Uh, <clears throat> and that's especially what, exactly what we're trying to achieve. A society where complexity isn't by necessity a sort of door closer. If you're not, if you're not an expert, you can't talk about it. That's not what we want. We want a society there where we start to have confidence in that all of us are quite smart and that can actually, we can actually handle complexity. And rather than to give everyone the same answer, sort of the lowest common denominator on what to do, which has often been the case, although I, I am all for biking to work, I think that's quite a general remark that doesn't give us a sense of what actually I could do personally. Uh, I hope that we can get to a place where scientific knowledge <clears throat> informs us and gets us to reflect on our unique place in the world <clears throat> and the big or small area of power that we have there, together with the courage and the boost, and this is where much of the music comes in, to actually act on that and to actually use that. And can I? Sorry. So imagine if we tried not to do the optimal, but to do what we can and to shake off that feeling of anxiety and to shake off the idea that what I do doesn't matter anyway. So I'd like to finish with taking the opportunity to send one of recent year's best songs, according to me, to the creatures that will find these recordings in the distant future and to give all of you here listening the opportunity to test if a song can indeed be quite nice to rest the ears, brains and thoughts on for a minute and see if the challenges and complexities that we face will feel a little bit more manageable. Thank you so much for listening.